Hello, mathematicians. Chris Pinto here with Skew the Script, and today we're going to talk about what polynomials have to do with machine learning. Let's skew it. Have you ever typed a question into Google and this happened? You start typing a question and it finishes it for you. Where does Drew Gooden get his joke? Or here's a more interesting example. If you're interested in the answer to this question, well, Google says Virgo. Don't know why, but watch out for them. Or how about this? Has a streaming service ever told you what to watch next? It's kind of spooky, but maybe not surprising since they've watched me and I watch everything. Or has a store ever offered you oddly personalized discounts? If you've ever been to CVS, you know how long these receipts can be. And they're always full of ads for the things that the company thinks that you'll buy next. For me, it's usually candy and toilet paper. Whoops. If you've experienced any of these examples, then you've most likely experienced what we call machine learning. Machine learning refers to the algorithms that help computers make predictions based on prior data. So our key analysis today, can we build our own machine learning model? Let's find out. You can follow along today using the guided notes linked in the video description below. We're going to focus on two topics in this video. First, we'll look at polynomial degrees and turning points. Then we'll see what this has to do with machine learning. Let's start by describing some features of polynomial functions. In 1a, our function is defined as f of x equals x squared minus 2. Recall that the degree of any polynomial is the largest exponent on the x term. Noting the degree of a polynomial helps us categorize them and also might unlock some secrets about the polynomials that we'll see later. So in this polynomial, there's only one term that has an x, and it's x squared. That means that we can classify this polynomial as degree 2, or to the second degree. Now we'll need the graph to find the number of turning points and the y-intercept. Let's start with the y-intercept. In general, the y-intercept is where a graph crosses the y-axis or where the x value is equal to zero. Here, I'll draw a circle on the y-axis to help me find that point. It looks like this is where the graph crosses the y-axis. So the y-intercept of this graph is negative two. We could also write this as a point, zero negative two, but for today, we will just note the y-value as the y-intercept. So let's think about this polynomial as a roller coaster going from left to right. Well, looking at the left hand side, the roller coaster starts by going down first, and eventually it goes back up. Not the most exciting roller coaster, but it'll do. This point here is called the turning point because this is where the graph changes from going down to going up. We're just noting the number of turning points. So for this polynomial, it'll just be one. Let's try 1b together, starting with the degree. Remember that the degree is the largest exponent on any of the x terms. It looks like the largest exponent we have here in our polynomial is 3, so our degree is 3. Remember, it doesn't matter what the other exponents are when you are identifying the degree. Now let's look at the graph and try to pick out the y-intercept. When I draw a circle on the y-axis, I can see that the graph crosses the y-axis at positive 2. So the y-intercept is 2 for this polynomial. Again, using our roller coaster analogy, there are two spots where the roller coaster would change directions. So there are two turning points on this polynomial. There are two more problems in your guided notes. Pause the video now and try them on your own before checking your answers with me. In 1c, we have a polynomial with degree 4. Then, using a graph, I can determine that our y-intercept occurs at negative 4. Next, again, I use my roller coaster, and I can see that there are three direction changes. Maybe you're scared of heights and the roller coaster image doesn't really help you, so we can also think of these turning points as peak or valleys. Anywhere that the graph looks like the top of a mountain or the bottom of a valley, we'll consider that to be a turning point. Okay, and now 1D. Here, we have a polynomial of degree 5, our highest degree yet. We can determine that the y-intercept is positive 1. And here, it looks like we have four turning points. What patterns do you notice in the four problems we just encountered? Pause the video and see what patterns do you notice. So when I look at 1a and 1b, and I focus on the y-intercepts, I notice that both of the y-intercepts actually showed up in our polynomial equations. 
the y-intercept in part a was negative 2, and the constant term in the equation was negative 2. Same idea for 1b. Let's see if this pattern holds true for parts 1c and 1d. Well, here are the graphs, and oh my gosh, look at it. This is a little bit spooky, that our y-intercept is just the constant in the polynomial equation. So here's the pattern. The non-x term in our polynomial equations turns out to be the y-intercept. It's not actually a coincidence or spooky at all. The reason is that the y-intercept occurs when the x value is equivalent to zero. And imagine what would happen if we were to substitute in zero for all of these x values. You don't need a calculator to see that, well, that's a lot of zeros. And everything goes away except the non-x term. So back to a and b. Let's check out the degrees. And we'll compare that to the number of turning points. When we have a second degree polynomial, we have one turning point. When our polynomial has degree three, we have two turning points. How about C and D? Well, we see that one C had degree four and has three turning points. One D has degree five and has four turning points. I'm sensing a pattern here. It looks like the number of turning points is always one less than the degree of the polynomial. Nice, so we just made another useful mathematical discovery here. Let's just make sure that our pattern is always true. Here's a really simple polynomial. X to the fourth would have degree four. But if I look at this graph, it sort of looks like the X squared graph, but the valley is a little bit wider and flatter. How many turning points does this graph have? Only one. So in general, our rule is that the number of turning points is less than or equal to the degree of the polynomial minus one. The number of turning points will never be equal to the degree, and it will never be higher than the degree. A grocery chain in Texas is trying to predict the number of fruits and vegetables its customers will buy based on their income. Their eventual goal is to find the ideal amount of produce to stock in different stores, located in neighborhoods of various income levels. So of course, they think to themselves, let's use customer data. A quick background note here, some families use SNAP or food stamps to help them pay for food they cannot afford. Texas has several programs that provide extra SNAP funds if families buy produce instead of processed foods. So the grocery store collects this data, and the x-axis shows us household income, whereas the y-axis shows us the number of fruits and vegetables purchased. Each green dot represents one shopper. Pause the video and reflect. What patterns do you notice on this graph? One thing that I notice is that high-income customers tend to buy a lot of produce. These households likely have the funds to buy organic food and also the time to prepare them once they get their groceries back home. At moderate incomes, there is less produce buying. These homes may not have enough funds to buy organic food and also might not have time to cook them. And then at the lowest income levels, there's a moderate amount of produce purchases. This could be due to produce buying incentives for people with food stamps. When you look at this graph, does it look linear, quadratic, or like a polynomial? Pause the video and consider this question. This graph appears to be more polynomial in nature. There are multiple turning points, and a linear model would be a straight line, and a quadratic model would just have one turning point. What we just did is not machine learning, but human learning. We identified patterns by eye, and we made a rough model, which we could use to predict future customer spending based on their income level. How can we build a mathematically precise model that automatically adjusts when more data is collected? For that, we will need to harness the power of computers. Now that we've seen human learning, let's take a look at machine learning. And specifically, we'll see what polynomial regression has to do with machine learning. So the first step of machine learning is to divide our data into a train set and a test set. So we will take our full data set and we'll randomly select some points from this data and remove them. The remaining data is what we call our train set. The points we removed will be considered our test set, but we'll get to that later. Step two is to train our model to use the train set that we just created. Using some basic code, we perform what's called the polynomial regression, which gives us the best fitting model of different degrees for our train data set. So once again, here was our train data. Let's first try a degree one model. Remember that degree one would be linear because the largest exponent on any of the x terms would be one. 
Here's what the code gave us for the linear model. I will use my success criteria as the number of points captured. We can see that our model captures a few points, but I think we can do a little better. Let's try a degree two model. Well, it does look a little bit better. More points are captured. Now we could also do degree three or degree four, but let's get really spicy and try a degree five model. Well, that looks good. Uh, it seems to fit the data points fairly well. And just for fun, let's try a degree 15 model. And this one almost hits every data point. Pause the video to reflect. Which model do you think is best? Well, eyeballing these models to pick the best one probably isn't the best way to determine the best fit. Let's find a more precise way to measure how well the model fits the data. Machine learning is all about teaching computers to minimize error. Error in this case is the actual value minus the value that the model predicts. Let's take a look at an example of error on the first model we created. Here's an actual customer. And when we look at the X and Y axis, we can see that their income is about $50,000 and they bought five fruits and veggies. But what did the model predict that a customer with $50,000 of income would buy? We can find this out by substituting in 50 for X. Notice that our X axis is in thousands of dollars. So that's why we're using 50 instead of 50,000. Doing some quick calculations and confirming on the graph, we can see that the model predicts that this person would buy about 14.2 fruits and veggies. So to calculate the error, we take the actual number of fruits and veggies, five, and subtract the predicted number, which was 14.2. It looks like here in this case, we get a negative error, negative 9.2. The customer bought about nine fewer fruits and veggies than what our model predicted. Pause the video and repeat this process with the other models. What is the error for the person who made $50,000 in income in each model? It looks like the error gets closer to zero with each model until it actually is zero in the last model. Let's consider the average or typical error in each model. Here are all the errors illustrated with these red dotted lines. And we'll spare you all the calculations and just show you the average error for each model. Based on the information, which model looks like it's the best? The degree 15 polynomial has an average error of zero, and this means that it's hitting every point exactly. It sort of seems like it's the best fit, but is it? Remember that we've removed some of the data points at the beginning of the process to create a test set of data. Well, the next step in machine learning is to bring that test data set back into evaluate the models. Once again, we use the train data to fit the models, so now we'll use the test data to evaluate them. Let's remove the training set and we'll see if the models are still good at their jobs. We can see how good the models are by looking at the errors. Hmm, I'm definitely seeing red dotted lines in the degree 15 model this time. Here are the average errors. It looks like the average error for the degree five model is now lower than the degree 15 model. In general, the test error is bigger than the train error. And why is that? We fit our models on the train set, so they minimize errors on that data. Machine learning algorithms select models that minimize the error on the test set. This is because performance on the test set mimics how the model performs on unseen future data. In other words, it's all about making good predictions using our model. And it looks like this is the model that did the best with the test set. Pause the video and reflect, why does this model minimize the test error? Remember that we fit models on training data, but the test data is new data. The test data mimics the model's ability to predict about new customers. And that was the whole point, to predict the amount of produce new customers would buy. Models that underfit are too simple to capture trends. Look at the details that the degree one and degree two models missed. An overfit model, on the other hand, is too complex and fit too exactly on the training set. It fails to capture the overall trend because it's so specific to the training set. This model is worse at predicting for the new data or the test set data. A well-tuned model is a good balance of both. It's complex enough to capture the trend, but simple enough to avoid overfitting. Our degree five model demonstrated good predictions on our new data. So to recap, machine learning involves splitting data randomly into the train set and the test set fitting polynomials onto the train set, and then selecting a model that minimizes the error in the test set. As you collect more data, you automatically repeat these steps to refine your model. And now behold, the final model, 
The machine has learned the pattern between income level and produce buying. This model will automatically update as we collect more data. Now let's think about this phenomenon a little more deeply. Imagine a grocery chain uses your machine learning model. Specifically, they use it to decide how much produce to supply in each store. Their predictions are based on the average income in each store's neighborhood. Here's some real data from a large San Antonio grocery chain. It shows us the number of organic food items offered at each of its locations in the city. As you can see, the larger the income of the neighborhood, the more organic items are available for purchase. Imagine the company used your algorithm to achieve this outcome. Consider this discussion question. Would this be an unethical use of your algorithm? Explain your thinking. And I encourage you to think of arguments for both sides by considering the different perspectives of the grocery owner and their customers. Thanks for joining today. Hope you learned something new and we'll see you next time.